Welcome to this lecture in which we continue to study the way we model random phenomena in simulation analysis. In this lecture, we're going to look at the input distribution uh, and how we determine what data we will use uh, as input to the simulation study. What do we mean by um, the simulation input data? Even when we did our very, very first simulation in class, we know that we could not have done it uh, without knowing something uh, so that we could build the simulation model on it. One of the things we had to know um, were the inter-arrival times between successive customers and the service times uh, for each particular customer. Uh, those, the way we did it, we had a very, very simple uniform distribution uh, that if you were doing this by hand, you could accomplish with a, a die or a bunch of chips or a deck of cards or any, any uh, random device. Um, in general, how do you determine the input data to the model? How do you do that? Well, if no other information and you're just testing your model, why don't you start with a constant? Uh, the same inter-arrival time, the same service time, uh, at least you'll be able to build a model around it. But you see what I mean by you need input data in order to build your model. Uh, then number two, you can make an assumption about the input distribution and its parameters uh, because you've studied the field. You know what other people say. You uh, know what theory says about the type of model uh, that you're studying. Talk to experts. Uh, so there is a there is something for, for you to base this on. You're not building a simulation model strictly out of thin air. Uh, three, you can use uh, historical data. You've got you, you if you have a, a model that you're simulating, and it's there's a real system version of it. Collect data from it. You have a string now of let's say inter arrival times, and just input that. You don't need to have a distribution when you have the actual variance, the actual data. Um, and then finally, and, and this is really the best way to do it of all, uh, you have a string of data. Take the data and use it to fit a distribution, a theoretical distribution. Um, then once you have the distribution and the, the parameters that you, you get by estimating parameters from the data, um, then you can you can sample from this distribution and you're not limited to the exact values that you collected uh, from from the, uh, the the real system. Um, why is this better? Well, the the real system data, the data you collected from the real world is actually limiting. It's very constraining. You've got these numbers, you've you got to use them exactly as is and you can never come up with another one. When you have a theoretical distribution that you have fit to your data, then you can throw your data away and you have a lot more information about what goes on in your system because these theoretical distributions have been very well studied. Having said that, how do we go about taking real world data and identify a theoretical data distribution from it? Uh, it's not the easiest enterprise. It's, it's doable and this is something we should do and will do. Uh, the question you're asking is, these data values that I got from the real world, could they have come from some uh, specified, some theoretical probability distribution uh, that we know of? Uh, so how do we do that? Well, first, we have the data. Either we collect it uh, or we've got it secondarily from some other source. Uh, second, we take the data and um, put it into a frequency distribution. Um, you create intervals, um, assuming that it's continuous data, you can you can put it in intervals. If it's frequency data and it, and it works as frequency data, use it as is with the frequencies you as your histogram. We'll see very shortly uh, how to work with um, discrete uh, data, data and put it into a distribution and continuous data and put that in a distribution. Um, so what do you do once you've created this histogram? You actually eyeball it. You look at it and you say, hmm, I wonder if this looks like, uh, if the, this looks like the, the curve of a particular distribution that's known, that's theoretically known and has uh, its properties known. 
Um, so that's that's step three. And once you've done that, or at least you hope you've done that, step four is to say, well, every distribution needs parameters. Uh, and very often the shape of the distribution changes depending on the parameters. So I'm going to use the data in order to determine, to estimate the parameters of the distribution. So for example, one of the first things we'll do is get the expected value, the mean of the distribution. And then finally, we'll use a statistical test uh, to see if this uh, data fits the distribution uh, that we're looking at or if it does not. And we have to go all the way back and try and start again. Well, go back not to step one, but to step two. What is a histogram? A histogram is a frequency chart. It illustrates graphically how the data is distributed across the possible values in your distribution. So the chart clearly from the image in the slide, the, the, the chart will look very, very different potentially depending on your, the size of your interval. Um, if your intervals are very, very large, the chart will be sort of like um, this, the image in the middle, uh, like V, and you really don't get much information from it. If your intervals are very small and you get a lot of bars, like the, the top image, uh, like the top distribution, uh, that's the same data, recall. Um, it's just too ragged with a lot of missing spaces, and it really doesn't help us um, come up with a picture, and here we mean a literal picture, of the distribution. And so in this case, uh, you can see that it do, going somewhere in the middle where the intervals are not too large and the intervals are not too small um, gives you a better picture of what the data looks like. As I said, we're going to see examples of creating histograms from data uh, that comes from a discrete distribution and data that comes from a continuous distribution. Uh, data that is discrete data versus data that is continuous data. And you see some examples there. Anything having to do with time is going to be continuous. Um, number of defects, obviously, anything that says number uh, or number of jobs in queue is going to be discrete. On the next few slides, we'll see some examples of data that was collected and graphed into frequency distributions, uh, in other words, histograms. Uh, this one is a weekly production, and um, we see that weekly production as the variable uh, was organized into intervals um, uh, that were, they're arbitrary, really could have been anything. And they're basically 45 to 55, 55 to 65, 65 to 75, and so on, with the first and the last categories being everything below and everything above. Uh, we've got 120 weeks, 120 pieces of data, in, and it was organized into this distribution. It has a decent shape. It could probably be fit to any number of theoretical distributions, but that's not the point. The point here is just to show you what continuous data looks like after we've constructed intervals and grafted into a, a histogram, in this case, a, bar, a vertical bar distribution. In fact, this distribution, looking at the picture, looks almost like it could be a symmetric distribution close to the shape of the normal distribution. Um, and the data actually supports that. Um, what's the mode? It's the bar with the high, the tallest bar, the one with the largest frequency, and that's 96 to 105 with the frequency of 28. The mean, uh, we would have to add up all the 120 values and divide by 120. You can do that. Uh, but just the easier would be figuring out what the median is. We start adding up the frequencies, 1 plus 1 plus 3 plus 7 plus 11 and so on, until we reach a number greater than the halfway point. So that we know that somewhere in that interval would be uh, the value between the, the 60th and the 61st um value in order and when you do that that's also in the 96 to 105 um interval and that's the same one that has the mode well the median is equal to the mode maybe and very likely the mean will end up in there also uh but you'd have to do that on your own all of those go into 
uh, trying to decide, number one, what the theoretical distribution is that you could try to fit to this, and number two, once I do that, what are my parameters going to be? Here's another example, another set of data. Um, much of the work uh, that was done in the previous slides well, is missing and left for you to do. Uh, some of it is not missing, um, and, and we'll talk about it. Um, this is time to complete a task. It is continuous data. We note again that time data is always continuous. And in this case, we have 100 observations anywhere between 10 minutes and 80 minutes. Uh, these are organized, again, into arbitrary intervals of uh, 10 minutes each. Um, and you can see the frequencies and the relative frequency. The relative frequency is going to become very important um, later on in this lecture. When you look at the frequencies out of 100, um, what's the mode? Same thing we did last time. What's the mode? It's the interval with the highest frequency. 32 is the highest frequency. And we're talking about the interval uh, between 30 and 40 minutes. Oh, well, look at that. The mean is 37.3 minutes. Um, we might be on to something here. What's the median? Uh, the median is going to be the 50% point. Something between, if we string all the ordered uh, observations together, and we actually, that's what we have here in this grouped frequency distribution, um, it's going to be between the 50th and the 51st observation. And um, if those are both in one interval, it's much less of a problem. And indeed, they are in this point. And again, we find the median is in the 30 to 40 interval. Uh, that's interesting. We've got the mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode. Well, right away, we're looking at distributions that are um, you know, more or less normal-ish, um, where you have the, the something resembling a bell-shaped curve. Finally, here's an example of a, a discrete set of data, a number of telephone inquiries that's definitely dis discrete, um, and these are organized um, into one-hour intervals. So uh, we've got 509 pieces of data, 509 one-hour intervals, and uh, out of those 509 hours, 315 of those had zero telephone inquiries. 142 of those had one, and so on. The graph is here. You see the graph is very um, familiar to you. And we could easily come up with the mean, the median, the mode, and so on. And we will, but we're going to do that later on in this lecture because we're going to continue to use this, um, this uh, data set, this distribution, in order to um, work with it uh, and see what would happen if we wanted to use that as input to a simulation later. Here we have another example of uh, discrete data, uh, which we've collected into a frequency distribution, but not graphed for you. I'll leave that exercise for you, as well as uh, computing the mean, the median, and the mode. Uh, take a look at this first. It's definitely discrete. Our variable, x, is number of defects. And um, we have values from 1 to 10. Uh, the frequency of each of those values is laid out, and we've collected 350 of these observations. Uh, in addition, we have the relative frequency, um, which eventually, um, when we want to construct a probability distribution, uh, is going to be a big help to us. Uh, we're not going to look at that now. I'm going to leave the histogram and collecting the, the statistics from this distribution to you. You can see that the shape of your data distribution is critical, is essential in identifying the probability distribution that you think it probably came from. How do we uh, assign an input probability distribution based on what we've seen in the data? Um, what, before we even try testing for a fit, we need something to test it to. We need to have an idea, a hypothesis of the distribution that our data came from. We could use theory, for instance, when we look at something like number of defects in a particular time period, it's a, uh, a discrete variable inside of a continuous interval that sounds very much like something that might be the Poisson or its inverse, the exponential. So we use theory um, as much as we can, which means we also have to understand our system 
uh, that before we even start modeling it. We obviously look at, we eyeball the shape of the curve that, that we've come up with. We may rearrange uh, the intervals in order to make the curve look a little different and look at it again. So art is, is involved in this enterprise. Um, and then of course, we look at the parameters sometimes to determine the distribution or the family of distributions. And then in addition, we will need it anyway uh, in order to, um, very often the parameters are change the shape of the distribution. In the normal distribution, um, the uh, mean and the standard deviation uh, affect the shape of the distribution. Um, in the Poisson, uh, the mean is equal to the variance. Uh, that's going to affect the distribution and so on. Over the next several slides, we're simply going to look at um, eyeballing the shape the, the from an artist's point of view uh, the different some of the different more common distributions that our uh, models will uh, be asked to use uh, this first slide has the ones that I think you may know uh, the most about uh, the uniform distribution is just a simple equally likely type of distribution it's it's, it's better than using a constant uh, sometimes, though, it's just a little bit better than a constant because if we don't know what the distribution looks like, we sometimes use that as a first attempt. And in fact, you know that, that that's what we did use as a first attempt in the very first class we had this semester on simulation modeling. Um, the normal distribution, very well studied from our statistics classes. We know all about it. And that's another reason that uh, very often it's one of the first Balash attempts when you're fitting uh, the input data of a simulation to a distribution. Uh, the log normal distribution, as we can see, is a family of distributions that will change their shape uh, depending on the parameter. Uh, the uh, uh, log normal distribution from uh, the theoretical description of this distribution that will give us an idea of whether we want to use it for our simulation project. Um, this typically is, is thought to model a process that's the product of component processes. So if you're using compound interest and your data is rate of return, including compound interest, well, you might want to see if you can fit uh, what the log normal, depending on the shape, depending on the parameters. The binomial distribution, as we know, uh, is the distribution that models the number of successes, well, however you define success, in a certain number of independent trials. So for instance, uh, the typical example might be the number of heads uh, that you get when you toss a coin uh, n times. So uh, we have a, a on-off success failure, hit no hit um, variable and we have a certain number of independent trials. The trials all have to have the same probability of, a, of success, and we call that P. Um, a, an example in quality control would be the number of defective items in a lot of size N. Uh, that's where the N is. What's the negative binomial? Very much related to the binomial. Uh, the negative binomial models the number of trials that it takes to achieve a certain number of successes. It's a little bit different. It's kind of the binomial turned on its head, which is why it's called the negative binomial. We already know quite a bit about the Poisson distribution and the exponential distribution. Um, let me make the point, recall that the Poisson distribution is a discrete distribution. It's the discrete distribution of a discrete random variable. And the exponential distribution uh, is a continuous distribution. And that's why the two pictures look different. And that's why we don't take a distribution like the Poisson and just draw a curve from the top of each um, spike uh, going all the way across. Uh, it's a discrete distribution. We've already worked with the exponential distribution. We've done a lot with the Poisson, but perhaps we haven't looked at it in this way as a distribution with this, it's sort of semi-curve. Uh, they're going to look different. A discrete probability distribution uh, will look different from a continuous probability distribution. 
The exponential is a distribution for a continuous random variable. The Poisson is a distribution for a discrete random variable. And um, we know that one is the inverse of the other. We've worked with these extensively in our simulation models that we've been building. Um, the interesting thing here, you look at the graph of under Poisson and you kind of saying, wait, why isn't that normal? How is that different? It looks just like a normal distribution or maybe almost a little bit asymmetry there, but it's very symmetric. The mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode. It goes down seemingly asymptotically um, towards zero. It kind of looks a little bit like the normal distribution. Well, uh, we know that sometimes, I was going to say often, maybe often, uh, the Poisson is used as a, an approximation, uh, or rather the normal is used as approximation to the Poisson. Uh, you've seen that in your intro stat course. And the fact of the matter is that um, the, the Poisson, when the mean is large, looks very much like the normal distribution that you see here. Uh, when the mean is small, it looks very different. They're all sort of clustered around zero, not in the middle like this. In fact, when the mean is small in a Poisson, it looks closer to what you see as the exponential curve on the right side of the slide. And as the mean uh, of the Poisson increases and gets larger and larger and larger, the picture, the graph of the distribution gets closer and closer and closer to what we think of as a normal distribution. Um, the interesting thing is though, even if you're going to use the normal as an approximation to the Poisson or the reverse, you have to remember they behave very, very differently. Uh, the mean uh, in the Poisson is exactly equal to the variance. That obviously is not true in the normal distribution. And so the behavior of the two distributions is gonna be quite different even if the sampling space looks very similar to the uh, naked eye. Here you see several um, probability distributions, theoretical distributions, uh, that you may want to use if your simulation model, uh, or rather the system you're modeling, has some elements that fit the uh, theoretical uh, description of what these um, distributions are used for or good for. Um, the Weibull distribution is often used to model time to failure for component parts of a larger system. So that seems quite useful for us. Uh, the beta distribution is used to model random variables that have fixed upper and lower limits, unlike the normal distribution. Uh, the gamma distribution, as you can see from the picture, is used to model non-negative random variables uh, and the, the constant shifts the distribution from zero, uh, very much like what you might see in uh, the, very, the, the other distributions like the Poisson and exponential. The Erlang distribution uh, is used to model the sum of exponentials. So if you've got a system um, where you have exponentially distributed time to, times to fail for a number of components, uh, and you want to know that the estimated time to failure for the system, well, you're going to be summing exponentials, and the family of Erlang distributions is something that uh, would be very useful for that type of model. Finally, we've got some very, very simple probability distributions. These are almost as simple uh, as the uniform, although the uniform you know, might be easier and simpler to, to describe and to use. You've seen triangular distributions, I would imagine, when you were using um, clouds or cloudus to build your simulation models, because that was one of the defaults um, in, in cloudus. A uh, triangular model, um, you need a a minimum, a maximum, and a most likely. And of course, therefore, the most likely is going to have a higher relative frequency. And you're not so concerned about smoothing out the curve. It's a slight improvement over a uniform distribution. And the empirical distribution we've seen in a different lecture, 
actually uses the data as is uh, in order to construct the di distribution from which to sample. Well, here we are. We're, we have collected data. We have um, organized and graphed the frequencies of the data into a histogram so we can get a picture of the data and compare it to the pictures of some known theoretical probability distributions. And then we pick one and we say, OK, I would like to determine whether my data can be said to have come out of this distribution. Actually, that's not what we do. The hypothesis we're actually testing, HO, the null hypothesis, is that our data uh, does not differ significantly from the theoretical distribution. Um, if we do not accept, if we reject HO, if we say, oh no, the data doesn't support this, we're rejecting HO. What are we accepting? We're accepting H1 that the data is different. All right, so you remember we're always setting up our null hypothesis as a straw man um, and it, in trying to reject it. And in fact, in this case, that makes a lot of sense because just because your data fits a theoretical distribution, doesn't mean that it would not also fit some other similar theoretical distribution. Um, all you can say with certainty uh, then is that, well, I couldn't reject it. It might fit this distribution, which is very much an honest uh, expression of what you're doing when you test for a fit. Uh, one test, the statistical test that allows us to do this is the chi-square test statistic. Um, and uh, we have we use it in order to test hypotheses about frequencies, or we could turn the frequencies into proportions pretty easily. Um, we look at our observed frequencies, what we collected from the data, and then we look at the expected frequencies from the distribution that we're studying. Uh, so we can take our distribution and we can say, well, if this is the actual distribution, uh, that the data came from, the data should have looked something like this, and we co we compute expected frequencies or expected proportions, and then we compare and we say, well, if they're exactly on the nose, that that means that the the two uh, the chi square the value of the chi square statistic should be close to zero, and we'll see that pretty soon. Here you see the formula for the chi square test statistic. Uh, we've got FO, the observed frequencies, FE, the expected frequencies, and the difference between these frequencies squared, so that we're not going to get a negative value of chi-square, um, that the difference between uh, these frequencies squared is then divided by to get it as a proportion of the expected frequency, or you might say relative to the expected frequency. And that's added up over k values or k intervals, because um, each of our frequencies is over a particular interval or value. So you know a few things about this. Number one, the chi-square statistic is never going to be zero. I'm sorry, never going to be less than zero. The minimum is zero. And when is it zero? Well, it's going to be zero if every single observed frequency is exactly the same as its corresponding expected frequency. So if everything is right on the nose, uh, it's going to be zero. Um, and that gives you an idea of what you're testing. You're actually testing these differences. The larger the chi-square statistic, the larger the differences between the observed and the expected, and the less likely it is that uh, the observed and the expected both came from the same distribution. The chi-square distribution is a series of distributions and each one looks different and has a different number of degrees of freedom. For our particular test, the degrees of freedom is computed as one less than the number of categories uh, or, or intervals or classes that we are using to test the fit.
Um, you know that when we do a test like this, we're using counts, frequencies. These are This is discrete, discrete counts. The chi-square distribution is a continuous distribution. It's a continuous approximation of a discrete distribution. Um, this works most of the time, but we have to make sure that the expected frequencies are large enough. So there's an assumption here that our expecteds are not too small. Uh, we usually use the rule of thumb that the expected frequencies should be five or greater. And if you find that when you're, you compute the expected frequencies based on the distribution that you're interested in, if you find that some categories have expecteds of less than five, uh, just go back to your data and uh, redo the intervals uh, so that you have you combine adjacent cells. And once you do that, you'll have less to fewer degrees of freedom, and you'll have to adjust that as well. We're going to do a quick little example here uh, before we get to a larger, more interesting simulation example. Uh, the distribution of a dye. We want to test the hypothesis that a particular dye is fair and uh, no one's cheating. Uh, so we want to test to see if the outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, six, really do follow a uniform distribution. So we're tossing the dye, we toss it, six, let's say, 60 times, um, and the results um, will be on the next slide. Um, and we're, we're, we're testing the hypothesis that the observed values that we saw in those 60 uh, tosses follow a uniform distribution. Um, and we're going to see that soon. Right now, what you see is the beginning of the hypothesis test, uh, where you're writing down your null and alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis could be stated as there is no difference between the empirical and theoretical distributions, with the alternate hypothesis being there is a difference. In other words, there is no fit. The null hypothesis, there is a fit. The alternate hypothesis, there is no fit. Um, alternatively, you could specifically say, maybe giving more information, null hypothesis, the random variable follows a uniform distribution, and therefore the alternative hypothesis would be the random variable does not follow the uniform distribution. So let's say that our um, alpha level is 0.05, which means we're allowing for a 5% chance that we'll reject the null hypothesis even when it's true. Here we're continuing with our hypothesis test uh, to see if this die is fair, if it follows a uniform distribution. The data is laid out in the table to the left. Uh, the values of the random variable, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, out of 60 tosses, you see the observed frequencies. There were eight ones, 12 twos, 10 threes, 11 fours, 12 fives, and seven sixes. Naturally, the expected frequencies out of 60 should all be 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, and they are. Uh, and you, we might as well continue the the calculated value of the chi squares uh, computed in that same table as um, 2.2. You can see it all laid out there how the calculations work following the formula that we saw earlier in a previous slide for the calculated chi square value. The uh, critical value from uh, the, the chi square distribution is in the graph on the right side. Um, we're using alpha 0.05, so it's 0.05 in the tail. Um, we have five degrees of freedom because there are six categories, so one less than that is five. And from the chi-square table, that gives us a critical value of 11.07. And what that means is if the chi-square value that we computed from the data is greater than 11.07, then we reject the null hypothesis that was on the previous slide, that, that, the, uh, that there is a uh, fit. And if the calculated value of chi-square is less than 11.07, uh, then we don't reject. And we say, OK, it could have come from a normal district, from a uniform, sorry, uniform distribution. And uh, probably uh, the die is a fair die. Uh, the conclusion, do not reject uh, the null hypothesis.
let's get back to our example from earlier. A number of telephone inquiries per one hour interval. Um, so we have a, a discrete data distribution. We've collected 509 observations, 509 one hour intervals. And the number of inquiries were distributed between zero and five. There were 315 intervals where there were zero inquiries, 142 where there was one. Um, relative frequency is the, the number of times an event occurs compared to the number of possible times it could occur. And so basically it's a proportion. So um, if there were 315 intervals with zero inquiries, 315 over 509 is 0.619. That's the relative frequency. And the relative frequency for uh, one inquiry, which happened 142 times out of 509, is 0.279 and so on. Um, so now we look at this and we say, okay, fine. I have my data. I have it all nicely organized in a pretty table. But what I really want to do is figure out what the input distribution is what the, the theoretical probability distribution is that this came from so that I could then throw this away, use the probability distribution in order to generate input data for my simulation. Here's the uh, graphical frequency distribution, the histogram. And like we said earlier, you chart your data, Think about um, the graphical representations of the various distributions that you looked at, and you say to yourself, hey, this kind of looks like an exponential distribution. So our hypothesis could be the random variable of interest here follows the exponential distribution, and we could be testing this for fit using the chi-square statistic. We know how to get the expected for the exponential random variable. The relative frequencies for an exponential are given by the formula you see there, lambda times e to the minus lambda x, where x is the value um, that you're looking for the expected uh, relative frequency. Um, but there's some, something's not sitting right here. Uh, and part of what's not sitting right is the fact that we're looking at the formula for a distribution for a continuous random variable, a probability density function. And yet on the other side of the page, we have a histogram uh, that was created from data that came from a discrete random variable. And in addition, let's go to the next slide. In addition, this data seems to perfectly fit the theoretical description of a Poisson random variable um, it's a discrete random variable inside of a continuous interval. Number of telephone inquiries is discrete. Uh, time, a one hour interval, is continuous. That sounds perfect. We should be looking at Poisson first um, before even looking to see how the chart fell out. And uh, it does make sense. And let's see what happens. It, it, even the shape of the histogram um, if you look at the Poisson with the appropriate um, the, um, expected value, it will look a lot like that. So let's try Poisson. Uh, the probability of X number of events is given by the formula there. What's in the formula? We have lambda raised to a power of X. We have E raised to a power of negative lambda. We have X factorial. So aside from E, the constant, uh, we have X, the variable, and then lambda, the parameter. And lambda is the mean of the Poisson distribution. We, are, we estimate it by getting the uh, mean of the data that we collected, of the observed. Um, and in this case, we find uh, the data, the mean from the data to be 0.5147 inquiries per hour. Then, Almost home, but not quite. Um, the null hypothesis is that this random variable follows the Poisson distribution. The alternate hypothesis is that it does not. Uh, from the table, the critical value is 11.07, just like before, assuming we're using an alpha of 0.05. Uh, degrees of freedom is still five, same as it was before, because we have six categories. Uh, that's what we found from the data, zero, one, two, three, four, or five 
uh, as the number of telephone inquiries we observed in, it, in these various time periods. Um, so the critical value is 11.07. If, if our calculated value of chi-square is greater than that, we'll reject the null hypothesis and we'll say that there is no fit. Um, so look at the table. We still have the columns of observed frequency, relative frequency. Now we get the relative frequency from uh, the formula for the Poisson distribution and using 509 as our n, uh, convert those to expected frequencies, uh, kind of like the reverse of the way we took frequencies and created relative frequencies from them. But really, just remember, relative frequencies in, are nothing more than uh, proportions, because they're probabilities, and frequencies are counts. Um, so the chi-square statistic, again, is observed minus the expected square over the expected. Add all of those up for every one of the categories. And we end up with something marginally rejectable. We have a chi-square value of 11.78. And so since we set up the test saying we will reject anything greater than 11.07, we must indeed uh, reject the null hypothesis. Uh, all is not lost. Let's continue. Take a closer look at this table. Uh, the expected frequencies column. We have um, number of inquiries 0, 1, 2, fine. Z number of inquiries 3, we have an expected of 6.92. After that, 4 and 5 are so low uh, that they, we really violated the assumptions uh, under which we're, this, this chi-square statistic operates. Uh, expected frequencies of 0.87 and 0.1 are just too low. So in the next slide, you'll see what we do to fix that up. All right, the null and alternate hypotheses are not repeated here because clearly they haven't changed. Um, the ob observed and the expected changed because we've collapsed uh, the categories with uh, three and four and five inquiries. Um, and so we end up with a chi-square statistic calculated from the data of 3.88. Uh, if we look at the table, the chi-square table, with alpha 0.05, the tail probability 0.05, now we have three degrees of freedom, four minus one is three. The critical value from the chi-square table is 7.815. Ah, and we're, we're, the, the calculated value from the data is uh, smaller than that, and so we do not reject HO, which is good. It means that our data fits um, this particular uh, Poisson distribution, and we can go ahead and use it in the simulation.